All right, everybody, welcome to Investigations. So glad you guys are here. Uh, I am Rick Thiessen. I'm senior pastor of AC3, and among other things that I do that I love, which is mainly teaching, uh, this is my favorite thing. And it's my favorite thing because I'm a, uh, a curious person, and that didn't stop after I became a Christian. And so when I started, you know, to think that maybe God was calling me into Christian ministry, it, it was just a natural for me to be a person who could help people marry their, um, their hearts and their minds. Because sometimes that is not a natural in the Christian space. Uh, so the idea is, well, we come into this religious environment where our uh, relationship with God is talked about, lots of spiritual concepts are talked about, and that seems to be, that's a hard thing. And then you have to check your brains at the door. And then we can't marry our hearts and our minds. And I've just never believed that that was a, that was a good way to go. Uh, my thought was, and it was just an assumption I made, and it made sense to me, and I've never had to let it go, which is that if there is a God, God is true. He's the foundation of all reality. And therefore, what is true is, has got to be uh, 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 in harmony with this God. And people pursuing truth, asking questions about what is true, ought to be something that that, uh, that God would, would love, would enjoy. And so that would include doing science, but it would also include doing uh, the question asking and, and some of the doubting that people do when they are involved in a spiritual journey. So that's our church. And our church has kind of baked that into its DNA. So we want to be a safe place to ask dangerous questions. And by dangerous questions, we mean, you know, questions that are like, you know, should I ask that because it's too heretical? Uh, is that okay to express that doubt about a really core Christian idea? Uh, is that too beyond the pale, you know? And the pastor would th consider that to be, uh, you know, his virgin ears, <laughs> you know, what he couldn't hear or whatever. So don't think that. Uh, if you've asked, the, if you're thinking the question, I've already thought about it because it's already been asked in this class. We've done this class for now 28 years, and a lot of these questions tend to um, repeat themselves because a lot of the same sticking points are just there about God, the Bible, basic Christian ideas, um, and how Christianity relates to the world and to other religions. So uh, if you've got questions on any of that stuff, um, this is going to be your opportunity to ask away. These books I've got out here just show you kind of that I have an unhealthy interest in people asking questions and maybe getting answers. So, you know, this is about a skeptic's search for God. Is the Bible true? People ask. And this, by the way, is a, a book written by a non-Christian. And so they kind of dove into the idea that, uh, you know, how much of the Old Testament narrative, for example, can we actually count as historical? Surprising answers. This is my book. Uh, which I just uh, finished and got published myself. Um, so wide distribution, dozens and dozens sold. Um, but anyhow, the, a big sticking point, and by the way, a lot of it, uh, thanks to this class, you know, so if I could get all the graduates of this class together over 28 years, thank you, because they really spawned the production of this book. Because, oh, here. So it was, so the subtitle is, it's called The Two Falls, at Reconciling a Benevolent God with a Brutal Earth. So a lot of questions, not all of them, and you, if you don't have questions in this area, don't worry. There's lots of questions in other areas. But a lot of this spawned from the science and faith creation evolution questions. And so, um, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, the resolution that we talked about was, you know, how to reconcile the creation count of scripture with the standard scientific model. And... When we did that, there, a subset problem of that was, well, we got a really brutal earth filled with carnivorism, blood, death, fangs, disease, destruction, and it's going on for a really long time before people show up. And how do we reconcile that with a good God? So that's that book, and that's a set of questions that people have. People ask about UFOs and how that reconciles, if their aliens exist, people are talking about that in the news lately. Uh, talking about the real Jesus, some people have questions about whether Jesus in the Bible is the real Jesus or if he was kind of made up and legendary, and are there other accounts more reliable? Creation, evolution, miracles, are they possible? The case for Christ. So I've got all these books, and um, some of them from a skeptical perspective, some of them from believing. But um, if you're interested in any of this stuff outside of class, you can come to me and you know, say, hey, Rick, you have a resource on X, and chances are I can turn you on to something. I want you to turn your attention to the screen for a second, um, just so you understand the ground rules, okay? So we're going to gather your questions today, 
And there is number one rule is there's no such thing as a dumb question, okay? So if you're thinking about it, if you think your question is dumb, at least half the group wishes someone would ask it, okay? And that's just because some questions, you know, they feel like they're, like I said, maybe too uh, controversial or whatever. Just throw it in there. We promise you uh, we won't be offended. Uh, so nothing, nothing dumb and uh, probably if you're thinking about it, everybody else has. Number two, we don't have all the answers. So, um, uh, you know, this is a bit of a, you know, a Q and A. It'll feel a bit of a, like that sometimes, you know. So you ask the questions, and Rick over here gives the answers. But um, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, so I don't want you guys to pretend that Rick has all the answers. Um, so there's going to be some stuff that I just, I'm going to say I don't know, and there are going to be some things where you ask questions on areas about which good-hearted Christians disagree. And I'm going to say, I'm going to try to be very honest about both the viable positions Christians take and then maybe my position on it and then let you think about it the way you think about it. And sometimes that's the best way to go. That is kind of teaching you guys how to think and not what to think. Make sense? Because sometimes that uh, is super helpful. Then you can kind of uh, dig into your own answers on some of these things. Number three, we, we operate from the premise that God does not play his cards close to his vest. Okay, so this is, we get this from Jesus. So this is a presumption in this class. So we want to be super open-minded, but I'm coming from the perspective of a convinced Christian. And in part because of what Jesus said about the search for truth. So he said this one really cool thing about seeking answers. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. The premise behind that is that there's another seeker if you're seeking answers, and that's God, right? So there's two seekers in the spiritual search. One is you, and you're saying, oh, I got a question about the Bible, or I got a question about religion, or a question about whatever, and you're seeking answers, you're seeking truth, and if there's ultimate reality to find it. But just understand from my perspective, from the perspective of the Christian faith, there's another seeker in this equation, and that's God, and he's seeking you. So if that's true, then uh, it's true that God is eager to reveal himself to you and maybe um, is, uh, this is the opportunity. This class is the opportunity for you uh, to find that out. And then finally, discussion is allowed. Check that. It's not just allowed. It's encouraged. It's absolutely essential. So um, there'll be times when someone uh, pipes up. Let's say I know James. James pipes up with a question. And someone over here says, well, I've always thought about that and I wondered about. And then we have a little crosstalk. That's cool. Okay, so we're just, that's fine. So we have a little discussion that goes along with some of the questions that we ask. So it's not just me up here monologuing, okay? So it's totally cool that you jump in on me too. Like if you, uh, if I'm not answering your question, please, like just raise your hand again and you say, oh, actually, Rick, that's not where I'm going. It was more like this because I don't want to waste your time. So, okay? So those are the ground rules and, um, uh, there are a bunch of different websites, by the way. So if you could start getting hot on this whole issue of, you know, I wonder if there's credible answers to hard questions. Um, a couple of uh, websites I've got bookmarked. This one is reasonablefaith.org. And um, there is a, most of the material here is generated by a really, really smart dude, a guy named William Lane Craig, that guy right there. Um, he's got two PhDs. Uh, one in philosophy, one in theology, several undergraduate degrees, and um, just an amazing, amazing question answerer himself. So they have produced some really cool videos on subjects that we'll cover. So that's reasonable faith. Then if you really get into the creation evolution type stuff, um, this website, Evolution News and Science Today, is really great. Um, and it kind of, it, just full disclosure, it critiques a, a, the fully materialist view of nature you know so if you come at nature and science from a position of well there's no no room for design this website critiques that assumption um, this website by a, a Canuck yes Hugh Ross I'm a Canuck by the way I'm Canadian so we'll make lots of Canada jokes here uh, so a fellow Canuck a guy named Hugh Ross uh, runs this website reasons to believe he's actually an astronomer and uh, has a PhD in astronomy and is another like super smart dude. So uh, this is kind of his bailiwick, right? Finding reasons for faith inside of uh, the interesting um, 
facts of science. So you may think, is that possible? <laughs> and so I invite you to check that out. So um, I'll tell you just a little bit about my story, then let's go around the room and just give your first name and a Reader's Digest version, like a couple sentences of how you found yourself in this class, okay? And then at least we're on a first name basis, and then we'll get rolling with the questions. That sound good? So, as I said, my name's Rick. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, and um, like I said, I was always a very curious kid, and I think I didn't have really a whole lot of reason to disbelieve the basic Christian story. Some of you probably did. So. Um, it'll be interesting to get your perspective. Uh, but I didn't, but that didn't mean I was a Christian. Okay, and so that was a huge deal, like to realize that you could believe the beliefs but not be a believer. Does that make sense? And that's a real category where you can say, yeah, I believe Jesus exists and I don't really have a reason not to believe he was who he said he was, which is a supernatural thing, son of God, savior of the world. But I did not have faith in him. And um, so it was a fascinating thing where uh, then I um, had a life-changing encounter with Christ when I surrendered to Him in faith. I felt God speaking to me about my past and my brokenness. I received the grace of God, and I was a brand new person. And what was amazing about that was that I just sort of assumed that Christianity might, might be true, but everything it promised, you know, about um, being made new on the inside, being spiritually reborn and all that stuff, was just sort of fancy talk. <laughs> I thought, you know, that's all that it really was, you know, that people sort of drummed that up or whatever. Then it happened to me, and it was like, oh, oh, this works. <laughs> and so for me, it was then, I want to know why it worked. Okay, so then it was like, does it work because it's true? Or was it like true for me because it works for me? Do you understand the difference? And I wanted to know. Well, was it, was it, did it work because it was true, or... Uh, was it only true because it worked for me, right? Like, and uh, you understand the difference. It was, was it subjectively true, but was, or was it objectively true? And so that set me on this sort of course of investigation, and that's why um, I'm right there with you guys if you've got lots of curious questions. All right, so that's me. Then we're going to go here, your name, and what, well, how, how do you find yourself in investigations class, mister? My name is Dwayne, and I've been coming here since 2008, and... I just, it's so stimulating, I just keep coming back <laughs> time after time. Glad you're here. Hi. Hi, my name's Jessica. Jessica. Are you asking literally how I found out about this class? Yeah, I mean, just, you know. about me and why I'm Yeah, just, yeah, whatever you want to say. How, how you? Um, well, I heard about this at Sunday service, so. Cool. I'm just curious. I want to hear people's ideas. Good, nice. I'm glad you're here. Jessica. My name's Alexander. I went to college with your son. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so you know, uh, do you know um, Nick too then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we all went to college together. Okay, cool. So we started coming here sometime and we came last week and heard about this class. Awesome. I'm glad you're here. It's great. Uh, James, I've been coming here for a little over 12 years. Uh, came just here uh, AC3 to study bank and wasn't a Christian at all and God found me here and I still think of myself as a brand new Christian and I still have a million questions. So. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I'm glad you're here, James. My name is Ron and uh, wife and I have been attending for just a couple of months and uh, for me I was raised in a Christian home, always felt like I was a Christian until I realized that I hadn't really made a, a firm commitment mm. and that was when I was a junior in high school and uh, it felt Okay, cool. It's like my story. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, my name's Diane, and um, I have loved the Lord as long as I can remember. I'm a child believer, and um, we're old. Mm -hmm. We've been going to church for years and years, and we've recently moved here. Okay. Yeah. And we are delighted to be here. Awesome. So the, the one that has prompted us to, to go here. Oh, okay. So, how do you know them? Actually, from another church that we attended. As a matter of fact, Darren was uh, our son's uh, best man. Was it an Alliance Church? It was. Christian Alliance. You and I need to talk after yeah. class. <laughs> um, I, I was 
you get raised in that class or in that church and went to one of their schools. So yeah, that's my sort of original denominational background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. We're gonna talk. That's God. So Ron and Diane. Yes, indeed. Okay, great. Okay. Very good. I'm so glad you're here. Awesome. Hi, I'm Linda. Um, I always, I always believed in meditation when I was growing up. And then my younger daughter, Holly, she does nothing but question. Hmm. And she believes now, she believes in God, but Jesus always was just a good person. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Hi, Ann. Been coming to AC3 for a long time now. Yeah. Um, I have been blessed with my faith since I can remember. Um, so it um, doesn't mean I you know, have not followed the path that he set out for me uh, many times, but the fact is that I've never, I just never lost it. Mm -hmm. faith has always been a part of my yeah. And so it's, uh, it, I, but I love this class. Mm. This has been five or six that I've come. And there's not, it is not a class that there's a new question or a new way to approach that I've been able to use yeah. with other people. Yeah. So it's a good thing. That's great. I'm glad you're here, Ann. And it is, it's always a new, fresh coat of paint. find out about questions about the world and how it is. And also, I want to share it with, uh, with people of the world. So yeah, good. So thank you for doing the live stream, Michael. Appreciate it. Jackson, wait a sec. Jackson, you're here. Your name is? Jackson, OK, very good. <laughs> Because your mom's working in the other room? Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm Rachel. I grew up in the church, like, all my life. OK. Um, actually, I was in a lake. I had answers my whole life. And the standard answer of they couldn't get something, if they couldn't explain it in a way, was you just got to have faith. Oh, yeah. And right. And this wasn't doing it for me. Yeah. So I've been waiting for a class like this my entire life. OK, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, I'm glad you're here. This is my third time. My oh. name is Marcia. Hi, Marcia. <laughs> and this is my third time of trying to come for the whole thing. Okay. And I already know I'm going to miss the next session. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. You know, so put, if I get a question in. Well, you know, we might do, it. yeah, what we should do this time is attach names to the questions so that we make sure we don't answer them when you're missing yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll try to. Roxy's going to be our stenographer. Hi, I'm Roxanne. Um, I've been coming in there, I don't even remember when I started. It was on and off for like three years, and then kind of became more committed in like 2018. Um, this was probably the first class that interested me here, um, and my sister told me about it. And I just come as often as I can because I like questions. I have questions, and then I like to hear other people's questions. Um, I kind of mentally keep track of the trends um, hmm. and like what the topics are right. for that particular one. Yeah. Um, I have been roped into helping facilitate an apologetics group. Um, oh yeah. Aimed at women. Yeah. But uh, I think it's a really good way to ground your faith, and it's mm -hmm. kind of what helps me. Awesome. I'm glad you're here. I'm Jess, and I've been here for about 14 years. Been to this class probably two or three times, I think. And um, 
I'm always kind of, I go up and down with my faith. I kind of struggle a little bit. Mm -hmm. I always want to um, retake the class just to kind of, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, find answers. And then my son Gabe had questions that I didn't know how they answered. So Got I'm it. dragging you to this class. Nice. So here we are. <laughs> So did she just answer for you? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I need to say anything. Okay, got it. We got Gabe over here. All right. Very good. Well, I'm so glad all of you are here. I really am. And so how about we do this? We'll have a short little word of prayer. We're going to presume that there's two people on the end of the seeking equation. You are on one end and God's on the other. And we're just going to make that assumption right out of the gate. And we're going to pray for some illumination. And then you're just going to populate this whiteboard with your questions. And uh, we'll do some interlude with that, like just maybe clarification and that kind of thing. We can talk about, bounce off each other for questions. And then we'll just collect a list. That'll be all we'll do today, okay? Then next Wednesday, we'll just start in it. We'll organize the list according to theme, and then away we go. Michael. One question. Yeah. I left my list of questions at home. Oh, you did? <laughs> How can I how can I help you? Oh, so are you are you asking whether you can bring more questions yeah. next week? Yes, okay. that's fine. Okay. Yes, yeah, we won't like shut the door on questions. <laughs> no more questions. It's like Noah's Ark. Sorry, am I not on or? Oh yeah, you also right. If you're online, feel free to write uh, your questions in the chat box, okay? Because those come in. Michael will read them out, and away we go. All right. So thank you. All right, let's pray, and then we'll start. God, we do reach out to you today. I presume presuming you exist, and that you reward those who diligently seek you. So uh, we are asking today, we're going to seek your face, we're going to knock on the door and um, pray for questions or answers to our curious questions and reach out to you as the ground of all truth and reality. And we pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to ask and seek and knock. Amen. Okay, so... What is it that makes you curious? What, what is it about the Christian faith that has stumped you, or a Bible passage, or an issue, or one of the moral stances that the church takes, or whatever? If you come, I'll, I'll, I don't even need to prime the pump. I'll go, Marsha. <laughs> I have wondered, when Eve was tempted by uh, the serpent, surface, yeah. how did God allow the serpent in there in the first place to tempt her, or was that... Marsha, I have a book that I'd like to introduce you. Uh, this actually is hugely at the center of uh, the whole theme of what I go into there. Gee whiz. Okay, so I will buy the book. Uh, no, and it really, it's not a book tour. I'm sorry. I'm just, we're having a lot of fun. But it is a, a huge question, and it's a good one. So uh, what's a devil doing in paradise? Yeah. Right? Did God allow it? Yeah. And yeah, it's such a great uh, why did God allow? There's so much rich uh, background behind that. Um, and it explains actually, so it, it's, it presents as a problem, like what's the devil doing in paradise? But then when we get behind to the answer, it starts to answer other questions you didn't even have, including the questions about how we reconcile a, a good God with the earth as it is, so bro broken and brutal as it is. So why did God um, allow the serpent in, in Eden? Serpent. Oh, there's another thing you're going to find out is that I can't spell. Uh, why did God allow the serpent in Eden? And to tempt. Oh, well, and that's a whole other question. Oh, okay. No, it's a good one. And like, so why, why did God present Eden as this fragile place where, where yeah, one fall and boom, the whole thing collapses, right? Why, why, okay, so, so why, um, why the, 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 the tree, right? The tree of knowledge. Knowledge. There we go. Why the tree of knowledge? Because, yeah, I mean... Um, it's like he put them on a precipice and said, don't fall. Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. Good question. Excellent. So there's so, yeah, this is so, it, those, those opening chapters of the Bible, um, so many questions 
uh, come out of them because they present problems to our modern scientific minds. But then when we get into it, we realize so much stuff is answered in them. So great questions. Good. Thank you. Good start. What else? Yeah. If, Alexander. If Jesus said it's in the conflict, why did he hear Paul after it? Okay, so when he says it is accomplished on the cross, yes. uh, why does he appear to Paul? So um, I just want to get inside the question. The assumption you're making is that when he says it's accomplished, what do you think he's saying? What do you think Jesus is inferring? Well, uh, his sacrifice. Yep. So then the, the appearance to Paul is like an additional... Like P.S. Yeah, P.S. <laughs> I got it, yeah. So... So if, uh, if the work of Christ is done, why Paul? So let me, let me get inside that question a little bit more. That's a good one. Would the same question apply to the other apostles who write other letters in the New Testament, like Peter, James, John? Um. I guess I sometimes struggle with why did Paul receive this? Paul specifically. Yeah. Um, okay, got it. So, because a lot of people, I say, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. This is really good. I th a lot of people struggle with Paul and imagine that maybe he was more formative for Christianity's beginnings than he should have been, or maybe more so than maybe even Jesus was. Is that what's behind this? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever heard the phrase Pollyanity? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Okay. All right. Got it. All right. So, and just to flesh out for everybody else, sometimes the assumption is that the letters of Paul have been so formative for the Christian church that it's like, well, we're, we're followers of Paul, and we're not really followers of Jesus. So it's a great question in that sense, to really ask whether there's a reconciliation between the ministry and work of Jesus and what Paul does. Are they in harmony? Or is there a conflict, like you said, a PS, and it's like, oh yeah, Paul has m more to add, let's say. It's a f and, and, it, and does what he adds conflict yeah, with well, the red letters? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Great question. That's a really great question. That's why I kind of poked around there to get at it. So, you know, can we reconcile Paul's letters with the red letters? Does everyone understand? It's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, Lots of people ask it, and I think you know, we're going to find there is one. Dan. This is a difficult thing, and um, I've never reconciled it. So why do you say that so many people, if you knew only a remnant would be saved? Oh, yeah. And the rest of people do it. Right. And it's really difficult. Yeah, it is a hard question. Yeah. So... Um, why would God create a world where many slash most would be lost? That's the question? Yep. Yeah, that is a hard question, and it relates to other questions just regarding the nature of hell and all that kind of stuff, too, which we, we will go into if you want to, or not if you don't. But yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to move these just because. What else? That's a good one. Howard. If you tell a story to turn people and ask them to repeat that back to you, you get very different versions. And these apostles wrote the Bible, so which one is correct? Oh, okay. Yeah, excellent. So, um, like, how can we trust the different accounts? Yeah? yeah? How can we trust um, all the different accounts of the life of Jesus, the resurrection narratives? Yeah? All that stuff? Yeah. Can I piggyback on that? Who yeah. wrote what when? Yeah. Who wrote what part and when was it written? Okay, excellent. Because I know when you, when you look at it, you, it'll be like, actually scribed by this person. Talking to this apostle. You know, yeah. The apostles yeah. themselves just write 
whole? That's a really great question. And see, it, it, just, it makes, it kind of blows up some assumptions. Uh, like, for example, chronologically, of course, Jesus and his whole movement and, and work and, and ministry and life and death are, are the foundation of the faith. But what, what was written first was the letters. And everybody agrees to that. That the Gospels are written after the letters. And that doesn't mean that the letters formed the Gospels necessarily. And that's actually a great question to say. Can you see that the, the story of Jesus precedes these letters? But, but in point of fact, the Pauline letters specifically and the other letters of the New Testament are on record first. So the oldest account we have of Jesus, life, death, resurrection, his entire story is from the, from the letters of the New Testament. And, uh, and that, that's just interesting in that sometimes people uh, try to put so much emphasis on the red letters and they'll say, well, those should sort of in some sense trump the letters of Paul if they imagine there's a conflict. And I don't think there is one, but they, if there is one, they say, well, the red letters trump the Pauline letters. But the Pauline letters are older and closer to the time of writing, or to the time of the events that we're talking about. So, but yeah, we'll get into this. this is, these are excellent questions. So we'll talk about the transmission. And Howard's question is really, really great. How can we trust the New Testament documents? Um, and there are so many witnesses, for example, and they all will have a slightly different take. And again, what we'll find, similar to the whole Eden thing, is that when you start looking into it, a problem actually becomes a strength, a solution. Uh, a problem becomes a point of confidence building as opposed to a point of, of weakness for the Christian story. When you say red letters, that's a little bit of slang. Do you want to talk Oh, about yeah, that? sorry. If any, everyone doesn't understand, red letters, most of, a lot of recent New Testament will put all the letters of Jesus, the words of Jesus, in red. So... Uh, so it's a shorthand way of saying the red letters are the words of, of Jesus and then the letters of Paul are the actual, like, literal letters that he wrote to churches. Yeah. So who wrote what when? Who wrote the Gospels and when were they written? Who wrote the letters and when were they written? These two questions we'll answer together. And uh, there, there's some really, I think you're going to find some very interesting stuff, especially as it relates to other ancient accounts, Howard. So that's what's fascinating. So you say, well, how do we know any ancient events happened with any kind of confidence and it gets back down to your question well we're, do we have eyewitness testimony how many how close are to the time of uh, how close to the events did they write and all that kind of stuff and and we're going to find some surprising things about the bible so there's a lot in the bible that i can't really wrap my head around yeah and i'm wondering how literally are we supposed to take things in the Bible, you know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. Like, I mean, things like that you don't really see happening today, you know? Oh, so specific so, things. So like, yeah, a, like, like a miracle report? Yeah, I guess so. And why, why is that? So cause should we uh, form the question like this? What in the Bible should we take literally? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would, that's the one I Okay. Yeah. For me, it was specifically the Old Testament because I have understood how it was more like presented to me allegorically. Right. But wondering, am I supposed to be reading this as a literal account? Right. Like history of the world, or is this an allegorical tale? Right. And it? yeah, yeah, very good. And there's some parts that are uh, you could, and this is because a fancy word for everybody, okay? Hermeneutics. Who knows what the word hermeneutic means? Well, Fancy word. What? A hermit. Uh, no, it doesn't have anything to do with a hermit. It has to do with Bible study. So hermeneutics are how to read and understand the Bible. So good hermeneutics are where you're trying to kind of grab hold of the Bible, read it in its original context, in its original language, so that you're understanding what the author meant. And so sometimes we will take something and we'll like put a literal take on something the author meant to be figurative. Or the opposite. Sometimes we'll take something that the author meant to be literal and we'll read it figuratively or in an in a allegorical way. 
And sometimes there's value in that, but then we maybe strip it of its authority or of its true historic value, especially as it, if it presents itself as a true story. And like, for example, the resurrection narrative. If you just said, I don't know you're talking about the Old Testament, but let's say the New, and you say, well, the resurrection, that's a, real, uh, that's a miracle report, and I don't believe in miracles, so it couldn't have happened. So I must take that figuratively. Well, you might gain inspiration from that, you might say, well, that was an inspiring tale of, you know, life triumphing over death, blah, blah, blah. And that gives me hope for when I fail or whatever. But you strip it then of its, of its intended meaning because if the author means you to understand that Jesus bodily rose from the dead, then it, and we don't understand it the way he meant it to be understood, then we've stripped it of its, or at least of its original meaning. And uh, it would be similar if, like, someone read, I'm trying to think of something famous, like... Um, Oh, like uh, a poem like in Flanders Field about the poppies of World War I veterans, and you read it like it was a love poem or something like that. It's like, no, that was written about soldiers who died in World War I. And so, you know, you'd strip it of its intended meaning. So it matters, I guess, is all I'm saying. It matters that whether we take it literally or figuratively, and we should do, be willing to do the hard work because there's sometimes hard work involved. Like, um, and, and sometimes we, we, we help the Bible not uh, be taken as a cartoon. Like, for example, when the Bible says God will shelter you under the feathers of his wing, and we say, well, that must mean God has wings. It's like, well, no, probably not. That's found in the genre of poetry, and it should not be taken literally. And if you take it literally, you turn, you turn the Bible into a cartoon. And similarly, if you want to spool that all the way back to a thing like Genesis chapter 1, and we say, are we obligated to take the days as 24-hour solar days, or could we take them as non-literal days? And that, make, that makes a massive difference, right, in how seriously we can take that text. So, great question, and, um, and we'll, we'll get into it. You're more, the more specific you guys can get, Jess, with this, the better. Like, so if you say, well, which thing are you having a hard time taking literally kind of thing? And then if you can come up with a couple of examples, that'd be great. Like, was the flood a worldwide flood? That's a great one, yeah. You can write that one down. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Flood. Did you have another one, Jess? Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, that's going to be fascinating to get into that. Um, yeah, and this is where science does help us with our Bible interpretation, because the science of archaeology will speak to some of these events. And did they recently find evidence of Sodom? They did. They they know. That's why I underline it. We're going to have a lot of fun with that one. Um, I'll just, uh, but, you know. I want to tease it. I want to tease it. So, so they actually, again, you know, most most archaeologists working in the field are not believing people. So, uh, uh, a symposium on the dig that they found uh, at Sodom and Gomorrah, the the site of Sodom and Gomorrah, which are two actual ancient cities in the Dead Sea uh, area, they they uncovered um, uh, evidence at the right layer. So, imagine that you're when you're digging, you're digging down in history, right? Because uh, cities get built up over a period of time. So you dig down, you get to the right approximate era of Sodom's fall. And uh, so they, they have buildings that have been uh, destroyed and human remains and pottery and all that kind of stuff. And when they got down there and they discovered what, what took Sodom out, they asked uh, the experts what happened. And they, they looked at each other uncomfortably and they fidgeted in their seats and they said, um, well, we're just going to say this. Uh, and don't ask any follow-up questions. A fire event. <laughs> and so, so that uh, that's a fascinating and very recent discovery. So again, there's where we get to say, oh, what, so is this sort of a metaphorical thing, or do we have some uh, reasons to take some things literally that we might have thought, well, that's just a legend. Jericho too, hadn't they found some? Yes, Jericho, same thing. They found well evidence of the city first of all. And by the way, that's an amazing thing about the Bible is that you can kind of go especially to these ancient accounts in Joshua and other places and use it as a bit of a search map. 
And you go, okay, well, there was a city called Ai, and it's described as being slightly north of the Dead Sea. So let's lo locate it, start digging, and they dig, and they, here's a city, right? Now, you say, well, why is that surprising? Well, try that with the Book of Mormon, <laughs> and, and that will not go well for you, right? Because the Book of Mormon is describing all sorts of cities and events that took place in North America. And then you start digging in the, in the uh, purported locations, and there's not one red shekel, right? So there's a real problem with other purported events in, in scripture, uh, uh, scriptures of world religions, and the Bible is, is an outlier in that way. Great questions. Okay, what else? Uh, Michael and then. Michael. Okay. Um, this, oh, I've been, this has really got to me. Like, Jesus told that he's there to fulfill the law. Yes. So we're, to me, my understanding, the law is there, and then we have the New Testament where it's this Jesus that's supposed to be compassionate and have grace. Yeah. But yet, he still said he doesn't abolish the law. He right. fulfills it. So I'm having trouble with this verse of Leviticus chapter 28, verse 13. If a man has sexual relations with a man, as one does with a woman, both of them will have to be done what both of them have done what is detestable, they are to be put to their death, their blood will be their own hand. So how does Jesus fulfill the law with that type of Okay, well the answer okay, that's a great question. So how does Jesus fulfill the law? In what way? Yeah. Because he he, he doesn't up like he is he's been quoted, he, he he doesn't abolish law, he's there to fulfill it. Right. And um and so, as it relates to this particular um, the the proscription on homosexuality, right? Well, when we answer this question, Michael, I, I it may have relevance to this, but it will be much more general than that, okay. because Jesus obviously is thinking about the entire law when he says this, not a, pers a particular proscription. But it's in there, though. It, it is. Okay. So then, in what way does Jesus' claim of fulfilling the law affect all the rules of the Mosaic Code? Correct. Yeah, 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 it's a great question. And so in what, in what sense, let, let's di dive just a little deeper and flesh out the question. In what sense is, are we done with the Moses Law, right? Are Christians yeah. who live in the Jesus revolution, in what way are we finished with Moses because of this word? Mm -hmm. Because you're right, he says fulfill but not abolish. Correct. Does, so does what does that mean? Yeah. Fulfill, uh, fulfill implies that it's like it's done in some way, but not abolish means we still hang on to it. Correct. So how do we, yep, very good. Excellent, excellent question. All right, let's keep going. Great stuff. Oh, Marcia, head left. My thing, three simple matters. Who wrote Genesis? Who wrote Genesis? <laughs> Moses, done. Boom. <laughs> well, he is he is uh, a traditionally ascribed as the, but it's not as simple as that. So we'll we'll get into it, because for example, the end of um, Deuteronomy has the death of Moses. So obviously Moses didn't write that, I'm, right? I'm just before the end of Deuteronomy, so you should roll into four. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! Okay. <laughs> I have to now tell a funny joke about that. <laughs> so we're, we're sitting there as a church. We, we uh, got a bunch of tickets for the last Chosen thing. So Chosen is, a, is a, a really cool rendition of the life of Jesus. And it's been in theaters. So someone shows up, and uh, one of the gals uh, says, oh, I can just hardly wait to get to the, um, uh, to the part about Jesus entering Jerusalem, you know, in the, in the, on the Palm Sunday, you know, when he enters into Jerusalem. And someone said... Uh, Oh, they, they're going to get to that. Uh, they're going to, what did they say? They're, they're definitely doing that part and also the, I can't remember, something else about the, the time when he gets into Jerusalem during the Passion Week. And she said, really? How do you know that? And they said, well, there's a book about it. <laughs> and, she says, and she says, is it on Amazon? <clears throat> yeah, no, it's, it's called the Bible, sweetie. It's called the Bible. It's been around bestseller, maybe you heard of it. So... All right, so who wrote Genesis? Great question. Let's keep going. 
uh, along that line, yeah. what translation would you say is best for a new Christian versus oh. say, uh, someone that was more experienced? Excellent. What translation? is best for different levels of maturity. Oh, brother. Roxy, are you getting this? Are you saying I'm mature? Different, the different levels of maturity. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm throwing my own handwriting under the bus. Uh, not so. so much your handwriting, it's the thinginess of the pencil. Uh, yes, that's right. I was actually thinking that it's like I that's okay. I'm getting it better. Uh, yeah, can you give me a dry, a dry erase from the, um, from the hallway? Of the hallway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, awesome. the secret stash? Yes, thank you. Dwayne. That we don't talk about. That's right. Don't let anybody else know. We're <laughs> okay. That is excellent. And um, there are a bunch. How many of you uh, have, are, are reading out of the King James Bible right now? And that's all you do? New King James. Lightly. New yeah. King James for you? Okay. The new, the new King James. Okay, yeah. That's, yeah. And that's a good one. Um, if you're going to read the King James, that's a good one because it kind of incorporates the latest manuscripts. That's good. Um, yeah, so sometimes if you're reading in a really old translation like that, it's sometimes because it's King James English, uh, it, it can be a, a difficult slog, right? The these, the thous, uh, the, the verb forms. So um, that's a great question because some, I will specifically tell people to stay away from certain translations if they're new to the faith, uh, just because. Um, Thank you, Dwayne. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, by the way, translations are on a spectrum. Uh, I don't know if you know that. Like they're on a spectrum from from very word to word, based on the original language, to thought for thought. And these are generally paraphrase, and these are generally called word for word. Or um, shoot, they have they have a fancy name. James Burner knows the phrase. For what these are, but like yeah, Young's, word for word versus what's that? Like Young's translation versus the message. Bible. Yes, exactly. The message would be over here in a paraphrase, uh, very loose. You're get, you're getting the idea as opposed to you're trying to stick really close to the original language, and sometimes you stick close to the original language, you actually hinder understanding, uh, and we'll get into that because some, some uh, ancient phrases do not transfer. You, you know the phrase lost in translation? That's a real thing. You lose some things in translation. You go, why did they say it like that? There's a phrase in uh, 1 Peter we'll get into. Uh, the literal translation is, gird up the loins of your mind. And most modern readers go, I do not understand that at all. And, but that is a literal rendering of every Greek word. Gird up the loins of your mind. And so... Translations have rightly taken permission to get the thought, and then that, but that puts them away from word for word and more. So, by the way, that you can't get a translation that doesn't do some interpretation for you. You're trusting translators, and you're trusting them quite a bit. And it's not wrong to do so. Uh, good translations will tell you who translated the Bible that you're reading, and they're usually listed in the front, and usually it's dozens of scholars, and they'll list their there are credentials to do it. You know the one Bible that doesn't do that? Is the New World Translation of the Jehovah Witnesses. There's been 70 translators and none of them are named. So you don't know their qualifications and you don't know why they translated things the way they did. And that's a special problem because the New World is, uh, puts, um, has a very unique spin on certain texts, especially ones that relate to the identity of Jesus because that's where Jehovah Witnesses are um, different. So, all right, cool. Great question. Brian. Yes, that's a really good point. So if you did not get that, Brian's saying, if you do some reading in the Bible and you're new, reading it in three translations sometimes is really helpful because then you get the sense of nuance of a particular word. You go, oh, I can tell right here that uh, this translation rendered this idea like this and this one in a slightly different way. Then you get the, the range of nuance. 
And you say, well, how will I do that easily? I'm not going to go out and buy three Bibles. Guess what? Get your device, <laughs> download version, and you have access to literally 50 translations right now. And, they'll, and most of them are audible, too. They'll read it to you. So you can read the same verse and just change translation, boom, 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 with the press of a button. So it's that easy. What's that? Oh, yeah, Parallel Bible will do the same thing for you. Yep. Yep. Very good. Yeah, and once you download it, you can switch between them very easily. Easy. Yep. It's called U version. Yep. U version. Yeah. You go read it, it speaks to you. Yes. When Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Is he referencing being part of the Trinity? Or? Is he saying that he's always been within God? Yeah, that's a great question. What does Jesus mean? Is he the word in the in, uh, I think it's John 8, 58. Someone check me on that. Uh, what does John mean in John 8, 58? It says, before Abraham. So clearly, he must mean pre-existence, right? In some way. So he's, that's a fascinating claim all by itself. Before Abraham was, I am. So he's claiming some sort of pre-existence, but then this incredible thing, right? It is. 858. It is? I got it right? All right. But then he says that, right? And, then, and, and if you're in the... Stones to stones. Say again? And then they took up stones to stones. Yes, right. Because they knew what that meant. We sometimes, we, the meaning is, goes over our head. But if you understand Yahweh translates generally into I am that I am, then you understand what Jesus is implying. Yeah. So, Alexander, you're specifically wondering, does he just mean preexistence, or is he claiming something more significant about deity? Yeah, I just think that just Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, noting it's it's it, this this phrase comes in the same gospel as John, and yeah, John one one, you got the same thing. In the beginning was the word. Um, so, in John, you get some of Jesus' most clarion declarations of divinity for sure, and that's maybe the most clear. It's a good question. Wait. So there's a couple different genealogies in there, and people point to that to date oh, yeah. the earth. So do you feel that that's a good way of doing it? How, how are, are those? You know, was Adam really 929 or whatever the number? You know, or is that a legitimate way of yeah. dating mankind? So can we date the earth based on genealogies of Genesis 10? I think is it Genesis 10? Roxy, do you know? No, so, anyhow, I know what you're talking about, yeah. and we'll get to it. There's one so, in the old and two in the new. Oh, yeah, okay, so you're talking about so Jesus. They, they usually take the sure, two together. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. So, John, I think it's Genesis 10, and then also Luke 2, we have Jesus' genealogy that goes all the way back to Adam. Yeah, yeah. you're correct yeah. on Genesis 10. It's the nation's descendants from Noah. Yeah, there you go. So that's, a, that's an excellent question, and um, yeah, we'll get into it. And um, there's obviously a, a lot of debate, intramural debate inside the church about how to take that. It's a great question, though. Yes? One practical question, you know, of course, there's so many uh, young people that are transitioning to, you know, from male to female and female oh, to female. Oh, yeah. And uh, as a Christian, uh, first of all, what should we accept or not accept? Yeah, yeah. And, um, How about that? How, how should Christians handle the trans phenomena? Yes. Yeah. And it is a bit something of a of a subset of the sexual revolution, and it is a significant one. You're right. And what does the Bible have to say about it? What's the Christian view on it? Uh, informed as we should be by our Scripture and all that jazz. Yeah. It's a good. Great question. And on that same note. Yeah, Marcia. How? I mean, since. We are to love and not judge. Yeah. 
how are we to handle this? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so how to, um, let's say, balance a, a, a truthful and gracious response, something like that? Without, without uh, judging. Yeah, without judgment. I forgot what Paul kind of like chapter first, where he basically you were you were supposed to speak the word, but with with not with. Uh, yeah, it's Ephesians four fifteen. Yeah. Speak the truth in love. There you go. Yeah. How are we supposed? How are we supposed, how are we supposed to speak the truth in love, in and, love and not and not judge? Not judge. That's there a is. that's a great actually. The subset of this question will get us into Matthew 7 because that's where Jesus says, do not judge. And if we know what he means by that, then it'll actually help us because if we take him to mean do not judge as in don't make a moral assessment of different behaviors and or ethical positions, uh, then we, we've, we've, um, we go amiss. Because the very next verses help us understand that he doesn't mean don't make any moral assessments. He means don't judge with a certain type of attitude. So once we get that right, then we realize that what we're not being asked to do is to not make moral assessments. We're just supposed to not make moral assessments in a particular way. Understand? Well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. So there's a difference between uh, judging in, a, in, in one way, let's say in a really harsh way, and judging in a way that it makes allowances for grace and mercy. There's two different ways to judge. Okay. We'll get to it. We're looking forward to it. Is that your judgment? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's my judgment, Mark. Would it vary or based on whether they were part of the church? Yeah, absolutely it would. That's really good. So um, does our, and that, that's really great, James, to expand this conversation to um, um, anyone who's um, engaged in behavior that doesn't line up with a, a specifically Christian ethical framework, right? Um, that's really good. Does our, uh, let's say, advice and or response change based on Christian commitment? Yeah, and the short answer to that is yes, and how so, we'll get into it. By the way, when I do this, I'm shorting the word Christian. That is not because I'm trying to exile Christ. It's because in theology classes, um, key is the Greek word that starts Jesus' name. Okay? So... So it's just a, it's just shorthand is how we learn how to spell. Okay, I got one in there then. It's not why Xmas. Do we, why do we call Jesus? Okay. Instead of Yeshua. Yeah. Why do we continue to mistranslate things like the Ten Commandments or words through Lexi Dixon and Ten Sentence? Um, and what, so what was the additional question? Well, like, like the Ten Commandments, they're not commandments. That's all, that's pretty new. It's the Ten Saying. Oh, got they it. Break down differently. Like the Jews look at those and say, "Here's ten sayings," and the first one being, "I am God," and put a couple of the other ones together. And then later it comes along, I don't know, fourteen, fifteen hundreds, and they start saying, "Here's the ten things you have to do." Like, uh, this is an agreement. It's not a command. Got it. Okay. So there's some. Yeah. Okay. Well, and the more specific you can get with that, James, the better, because then we can get like specific, like because that probably only applies to certain things, commandments versus sayings. Um, some some people bring this up, this issue of why why we've mistranslated things and then they become embedded in the in the in our in our modern psyche is is the words uh, used uh, for homosexual in First Corinthians chapter six, so that's another. Like, bit of a kill. bugaboo. That's a mistranslation. And thou shalt not kill or whatever. Yes. It's murder, and it's got a very specific yeah. aspect. And that creates barriers to people who say, well, God doesn't, if God's killing in this in the Old Testament, but he says don't kill, they right. don't match. But he doesn't say don't no, kill. No, that's right. He yeah. says, you know, there's, there's murder a is a different. The Old Testament says it's justified to do this right. in these situations. 
Right, right. It, it amounts to a, a prohibition against taking innocent life. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why does why didn't God offer guidance to Lucifer before before casting him down? Oh, okay. That's a great question. Why didn't God offer guidance to Satan before casting him out? Of course, the assumption of the question is that he didn't. Right? And then, and then we have to ask, what do we know about that? Right? Like that is actually behind that question, which is a really good question. But then you say, okay, wait, uh, what am I presuming when I ask that question? And then, and then we say, wow, what do we even know about this event, which every Christian seems to imagine that they know happened in some, you know, based on biblical revelation. And it turns out we know maybe less than we thought we do. Yes, yes. But then in, in early in the Old Testament, it seems like he does still have access, right? In Job and that sort of thing, yes. So that whole question gets a bit murky, but nevertheless, uh, we can ask, like, in, in a more generic way, what, why would God even allow for the fall of a great creature, a creature like Satan in the first place, right? Because of all the devastating things that would flow from his fall. Yeah, great question. Okay, did, what else? Did the angels have the ability to choose as well? A good good well. Well? Yeah, see, so that is actually, now you're kind of getting into where we're going to go with this. Do angels have free will? And just imagine for a second that they didn't. I mean, what would we be imagining? We'd be imagining a super race of spiritual beings of incredible power and intelligence that weren't capable of making a free choice. So they would be like robots. And well, so then you'd have to say that they were created to fulfill that role if you had no free will. Right. And then what does that imply about God? Right? Yeah. Michael. When is the apocalypse supposed to be coming? When what? When is the apocalypse supposed to When is the apocalypse going to... We are going to answer that in, like to the day. Everybody, mark your calendars. <laughs> when everybody says it doesn't. That's yeah. Right. When we will the apocalypse... Oh, happen as, as stated in the uh, book of Revelation. Everybody's hot on the trail of that because of the solar eclipse, which we know. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny that Christians date set like that. When one of the most specific things Jesus ever said about the end times is that no one knows. Not even him. Not even him. Okay. So um, that is, you know, just a, a, what, a, what an irony, right? What an incredible irony. But that's one thing we, we steadfastly refuse not to do is set dates. Oh, you get, okay, that's a question right there. If he's supposed to be, I am, would he know that? When he know it? Oh, okay. Well, so that, yeah, great question. So, uh, uh, he does say, like, I, no, he doesn't know, but yeah, my yeah, father yeah. knows, but it's, it's it, an excellent he, question. He so, is. how can Jesus be God and not know stuff? Yeah. <laughs> not know stuff. <laughs> Mine kind of piggybacks on that a little bit. When uh, when his mother asked him to turn the water into wine, he says, "My time has not come yet." Woman, but my does. time has not yet come. <laughs> well, but my he time. Does, but he does it anyway. So has not yet come. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, so, so what are you what are you what, imagining? There? So was the plan not as set in stone as we would imagine God's plan of redemption or revelation? Yeah. Uh, what what does Jesus changing his mind imply, yeah, right? What, and Jesus slash God, because God changes his mind a couple times in the Old Testament too, right? What, what does no, sorry? What does Jesus changing his mind mean? Well, 
whole Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. and then their, and then we can we can also look at God in the Old Testament. So Roxy, can you get that too? Like so, God in the Old Testament also changes his mind like twenty three times. It says that God repented. Fascinating term. God repented in the Old Testament. So we'll look at that. Um, let's start again here. Roxy, have you got this? Okay, very good. Boy, this is a great list of questions. This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, someone else had their hand up. Here. Why did God create a sun that gives us cancer? Okay, yeah. Why did God... I'm going to make this more general, if you're okay with that, Gabe. Make, make natural evil. Because let's put all sorts of things in this, right? Like, let's not just limit it to the sun, right? Like, what about disease? Why did God make disease? Why did God put us on an earth where everything looks like it's trying to kill us, right? Yeah, okay. okay. There's a book about this. Yes, I just happen to have a box full of them. Dozens and dozens of them. Um, Two question marks? It's good. What else? So Jesus tells us to pray like this. What, what is prayer and what words do you use for it like in the Old Testament? Is it a consistent use? Is it a consistent conversation? At what is prayer? What is prayer? Prayer. And then specifically, like, how, how did, related to how did Jesus teach us to do it? Well, I mean, he, he tells us, you know, do it like this. Jesus per but, model. But, like, when we look in the Old Testament, is that the same wording, the same words used for prayer? Like, what, oh, what for the, the actual word yeah. prayer. Okay. I don't even, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to have to look that up. So, is the word for prayer in the Old Testament the same as the word for prayer used in the New? Okay. I was going to go a different answer, like a uh, different question is who tells exactly how to pray? How did the Old Testament pray? How did the Old Testament people pray? Yeah. His, 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 his uh, people pray to God. So yeah. How is, like, well, we have a huge record of it in the Psalms. Okay. So the Psalms give us a massive window into how Old Testament people okay. prayed. And then that's the idea that we just talk to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, it's a fascinating insight because um, think about this. Most Old Testament, t ancient Near East tribes, the, you know, their relationship with their deities was incredibly impersonal. And it was basically about beseeching the powers for favors. And to do that, of course, it was often about um, not just sacrifice, but also um, you know oaths that you made. Sometimes massive sacrifice, like your own children. A child sacrifice was ubiquitous in the ancient Near East. Every single tribe did it, except the Jews. And the Jews um, had this wild thing. So it, it relates to this issue of prayer, because then you look at the 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 Old Testament Psalms, and they're like talking to God like a friend, and that is utterly unique in the literature of the ancient Near East. So not just like a friend, but like someone that you could get mad at. If you, if you read the Psalms, the psalmist is sometimes angry with God and struggling with God and wrestling with God. And that's a fascinating thought. The name of that people group that we call God's chosen people are named after their forefather, Jacob, whose name was changed to what? Does anybody know? Israel. What does Israel mean? If you break break down the word Israel, what's that? The people of El, the people of, the people of, the people of, the people of God. No, El definitely refers to God. So El, Isra is means fights. Fights with God. Fights with God. Struggles. Struggles with God. Yeah. Fascinating, right? The name of God's chosen people is fights with God. Because that's what Jacob did. Now, and then you go to the Psalms and you talk about what, what is being shown to us here of what a, what a relationship with the living God looks like, and it's someone fighting with God. 
So sometimes we think that fighting with God is uh, impertinent, it's heretical, it's inappropriate, it's sacrilegious, and yet God named his favorite people, fights with me. Fight with me. Fascinating, isn't it? And, and conversely, and I won't get into it. I was going to make a comparison to Islam. We'll talk about that later. But, uh, but yeah, that's a fascinating thing when it comes to what we're seeing modeled for us in the Old Testament in terms of prayer. And, and it will also relate to Jesus' prayer model, too. So, so some of that, that Christian language, you know, uh, it, 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 to people outside the Christian faith, it can feel very familial. Like, oh, brother, you and the Lord. And, and, and Christians talk about, you know, my walk with Jesus. And, well, there's good reason for that, because baked into the entire narrative is the idea that God wants a relationship. And so, you know, it shows up in how we pray. Gabe. Why is there a God that claims to give free will uh, flood, the, uh, flood the earth with like the rain of heaven? Well, yeah, yeah. Whether it's local or, or universal, the, the, the clear implication is that God is judging the world. No question, right? Why does God have the right to do that? Why does God... Um, judge if he gives free will. Ah, uh, great question. So, um, here's God says, I give you free will, you can choose me or not. And then he disciplines people for not choosing him. Is that the problem? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, so we'll get inside that. Some of the answer will relate to what is natural consequence versus what's unnatural. Like what would be like in, in your, like as a kid, let's say, some discipline comes on you just because it's natural. It's like the natural consequence of ch choosing a certain path. And then other consequences are imposed. So that's what you're talking about with this, right? That's a discipline that was imposed, as opposed to just a natural consequence. Well, I kind of, uh, like another thing to add on to that, like, did God try to help uh, help them before He flooded them, and what did He do? Mm, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, did God um, try to reach them before the punishment? Great question. How do you reach somebody without breaking free will? Right, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, reach. What level, <laughs> what level of coercion is okay, right? And that relates to people today, right, who are seeking God and saying, well, one of the questions people often ask me is, if God wants me so bad, why doesn't he, like, write my name in the sky? Right? Like, you know, Rick, you know, I love you. You know, surrender to Jesus and be mine. Well, okay, well, look, there it is. Okay. So we have to ask ourselves that the, the, the extent to which God gives free will and how important that is to God and what constitutes coercion, which would violate this. Yep, that's a great, 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 great question. Was there another? Yeah, please. How are we supposed to use our Bible? I mean, we're not, just, don't just flip it open and read each day somewhere. What, yeah. What's the study plan for a new believer or even somebody that's straight away from God for a while? How should I read my Bible? That's great. I like a plan. Yeah. Yeah, so like, so uh, the assumption is don't just start on page one like you would a normal right. book. Like I would hand you a book and thought, well, page just, one. God will answer me yeah. if or I just flip, flip it, it open, open right you know, magic Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great question. To Michael. The contradiction of faith and work. Okay. Uh, faith with, where it says you can't have faith without work. And, and then in James it says that, a man is justified by what he does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, it feels like it's contradiction. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. How to reconcile, um, are we saved by, by grace or by works? And then specifically that James passage is James chapter 2. Yeah, and yep, yep. That's a great question. Brian. 
Okay. Yeah, that's good. Sometimes people have responded. They say, well, what, you know, I, I've said to some people who've asked me, you know, what's my denominational background? And, you know, I'll give it because, you know, I have a particular history in the Christian faith. But then they want to know if you're died into or um, uh, bought into the very specific nuances of belief of a particular Christian stream. And sometimes I'll just say, I'm too busy trying to be a Christian than to be a good Baptist or a good Lutheran or a good whatever. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to respond. Um, that's not to say there's not value in the different denominations because they do have different emphases that, that sometimes help each other. So, for example, there was a real move in the church in the 70s toward an openness to the Holy Spirit and to more free-flowing worship and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that infected, in a good way, the Catholic Church. So there was a, it was a Protestant movement that actually affected the Catholic stream. So sometimes there's a beautiful way which we learn from each other. Now I would say there's a, a, a great learning that's happening in Protestant streams that have very much, uh, I guess, um, been harsh towards their Catholic brothers and sisters. And they're kind of, there's a lot of learning now being brought into the Protestant stream from uh, uh, saints from the uh, Catholic past, from uh, Catholic writings and traditions and so on. So uh, your open-mindedness is really good, Brian, and I think that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. And others? More questions? Alexander. Uh, you're talking about how much is really about said about the war in heaven and the fall. Yeah. How much, how do we properly judge what exegesis is as valuable as what's actually in the Bible. Um, say that again, like just rephrase that. For as far as just like figuring out the fall of Satan, like are, why do we believe that? Are we doing justice to the text that we sometimes use to, to describe it? Well, maybe I'm being a little nebulous, but is it better to take my own judgment of what's actually said in the Bible or like like, how much value versus just the Bible versus, like, say, Augustine? Oh, I'm with you. Okay, got it, got it, got it. That's a great question. And it's at the heart of the whole Protestant-Catholic split. Because, of course, you probably know, right? The Protestant split was the, the mantra of the Protestants. A little history here. Everybody was a Catholic until the Protestant Reformation. Then the Protestants protested. That's where they got their name. They protested that church tradition and the, and the Pope were equal in authority to the Bible. Okay? So Alexander's question is, can I just go to the Bible and just read it and just get my own interpretation? Or should I rely on other interpreters, including church history, important figures in church history? And that's really, really a good question. And... Um, yeah, so it's a great question, and without you know answering it all the way, I will say that um, going solo into our Bible reading without any interest in outside voices can really get us into trouble. And I would say some of the perverse expressions of Protestantism that eventually landed people in 
I would say, cult territory. In other words, that's no longer recognizable as a Christian religion is as a result of what you just said. Going to the Bible and not paying any attention to what other Christians have said. So, for example, the Jehovah Witnesses were basically started by a guy named Charles Taze Russell. And Charles Taze Russell was a rabid anti-Catholic. And as such, he felt like almost everything the Catholic Church did was wicked, including every doctrine they ever sort of fleshed out and crafted for us, including the Trinity. So they rejected the Trinity. And then you say to yourself, well, wow, I mean, almost every Christian at all times, in all places, has believed that God is a tri-personal being, and that's been set in the creeds, and it's just what all, and then all of a sudden this guy says, nope, and, you, and if you polled him, you say, well, why are you doing this? Because, well, I read the Bible, and it doesn't say that, you know? So that's the danger, right? That's the radical extreme of the Protestant impulse. And so somewhere back in the middle is probably uh, the right way for us to go, but that's an excellent question. Say, um, uh, sh should I um, read the Bible? without AIDS, or pay attention to, let's say, creeds, voices of history, church fathers, church fathers excellent, yep. Yeah, great question, excellent. I just want to point out yeah. point of iron. Yeah. not to read the Bible without any guidance. Yeah, and, but so guidance... They've done that to start. Right, and right, yes. So, so <laughs> yes, because now we need to read it through the lens of Charles Taze Russell and the Watchtower Society, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. How ironic. Yeah. Yep, that's excellent. <laughs> what really, like, what happens in the Tower of Babel? Okay, yeah. fascinating story in the Bible as it relates to today. You know why? Because it feels like what God did was stop human advancement. He stopped technology. But yet it paid the cost. He slowed it down. And you say, why? And, and we'll get into it. God says why, and it's, yeah, it's a great question. Gabe. But let me follow up with that. Yeah. He said for the Bible, but in the Pentecost, Oh, yeah, and that's a completely different thing. So then what happened there in terms of the languages and then the converse or almost like the flip uh, story, Pentecost, in the New Testament is like reversing world. It's like Babel reversed. And that's an excellent observation. Yeah. What are we doing for time? Oh, that's it. So um, I want to honor you guys' time. So let's stop there. But like, hey, listen, this is great. Like we're trucking all the way up to 8 o'clock with questions. So you can just see, right? You start priming the pump, and, and just it comes out. So Roxy is going to do us a huge favor. She's going to type up this amazing list. We're going to organize it in, in set topics. And then we'll handle however you want to handle it without any um, guidance from you guys. I'll just go start. We'll start probably with the Bible questions because we'll answer a lot of the questions based on assuming the Bible has a historical merit and veracity. So what reasons do we have to believe that? So we'll start with those questions probably next week, okay? And then, um, uh, yeah, so how about we close with a quick word of prayer. I'll hang around afterwards if you guys have other questions, and like we said, and bring your questions next week. We'll add them to the list, okay? God in heaven, we are reaching out to you, again, presuming that you reward those who diligently seek you, and we have... Uh, minds that want to be married to our hearts, that there could be uh, an avenue of relationship where we have knowledge and experience. And this is what we long for. We pray that you would reveal it as you reveal your truth to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, everybody, so glad you're here. This is a great class. This is going to be awesome. Seriously, these questions are really, really great. So we'll start unpacking them next Wednesday, okay? Thank you. You bet.